you don't really have a game until you have that first closed loop where the the player can do something in the game, see some effect, get some feedback, and then have that come back to them to change their future intentions and, and future mental model. Welcome, welcome to Secrets of System Design with Mike Sellers. So Mike wrote an amazing book called Advanced Game Design, A Systems Approach. Those of you who know much about game design know that game design is a team sport. And there are lots of different um, approaches to game design. There's narrative, there's very artistic approach, there's a simulation approach, there's uh, puzzle games, there's combat games and you know very advanced combat systems. A lot of people go into making games, but what underlies all of the most long lasting digital games, and in fact, what underlies great board games as well, are systems. And that's what we're here to talk with Mike about today, to learn about what systems design is, why it's so important, and why you as a product leader entrepreneur, innovator, need to harness the power of systems design in your work if you want to thrive in the 21st century. So Mike, I want to start off by asking you why you feel systems design is a key 21st century skill. Oh, it's that, that's such a, it is such an important thing. And it's such a deep question. I think what it comes down to is that um, systems are everywhere. They're in everything we do. They're inside us, in our relationships, in our products, in how our products are situated with where they're used. So they're they're really just um, they're they're everywhere. Uh, and the way we look at we start to find these is by looking for interconnections between things rather than just snapshot values. So, you know, from a business point of view, if I say <clears throat> our inventory is 100 units, that tells me something, but really doesn't tell me a lot. If I understand, oh, the system that the inventory is part of a system, and I need to understand you know, our income and our outgo and all of that, suddenly I have a much better understanding of our of, of our business. And that, you know, we can look at that across everything from our own personal health to, like I said, our relationships and our businesses and, and certainly games too. Uh, but this has been something that that has been identified uh, at least as far back as the mid-1990s uh, by the US government as a key 21st century skill. Uh, I think it's something that more and more is interconnected as our world is becoming and has become. It's just something that we all need to understand better than we traditionally do. Got it. That's So it's not just you who's saying it. It's been identified by the government. Exactly, yeah. So what are some of the best metaphors that you found for explaining systems to everybody? It's so funny because we all sort of intuitively know this, and yet... Um, articulating as is really pretty difficult sometimes. Some of the, a couple of things I guess I can point out that are the simplest things. The first one is loops. Um, loops happen everywhere, where you have you know uh, one thing that affects another thing and it goes back and affects the first thing. As a very simple example, uh, we certainly see this throughout games and throughout all different kinds of products. Uh, we can talk about um, reinforcing loops and balancing loops. I talk about a lot about this in the book. Um, but for example, a, you know, a simple example of a, a balancing loop would be uh, like a thermostat in your house, uh, where uh, right or an, or an oven. So if I have, if I'm trying to heat up an oven or heat up my house, um, I I you know turn up the heat, and as the heat gets closer to the goal that I have, uh, it actually applies less heat into the system. So that that balances itself. That's a nice balancing loop. Um, you can also look at supply and demand, for example, as a um, uh, that that we're uh, two parts of the system will balance each other, um, as opposed to uh, a reinforcing loop where one thing drives another. So I can say things like, um, the more uh, money you have, the more, uh, the more interest you're gonna get on that money, and that's gonna give you more money, which gives you, you know, th that just becomes a, a, a increasing spiral. Of course, the same is true of debt. Uh, so it's not always a, a positive thing, it, but you can reinforce negative things as well. Um, so anyway, loops are, are really just about the simplest metaphor we have. And it, one of the other kind of hidden important thing there is we tend to think of things as being very linear, where A affects B affects C, and we're done. 
And that's, uh, that's a very kind of reductionist, very American 20th century way of thinking, as opposed to thinking in things being interconnected with each other and really affecting each other. And the, that leads us to the other big metaphor that, that I, I love and, and spend a lot of time looking for, and that's emergence, where you have uh, these loops in a system that create a new thing at a higher level of organization. So, um, you know, you might have a bunch of people, 10 or 12 or 1,000 people working in a product group. And they create a new division, which may, or they, you know, they create a corporate division or a new company. And just like in a, in a flock of birds, this is a, it's just such an excellent example. You can see that there's something bigger there that no individual bird in the flock understands or, or knows about. And these three rules that are listed here in this graphic are the three rules to flocking. If you if you create a computer simulation using those three rules, you'll create beautiful, realistic um, flocks of birds or, or schools of fish. And the interesting thing about this, other than the fact that it's it's compelling and beautiful and, and wonderful to see, but from a from a product design point of view, from from a business point of view, one of the interesting things to me is that you can understand this as a flock and talk about where the flock is going without needing to understand the actions of every individual bird. Or sometimes I've talked about you can look at the course of a river without understanding where every drop of water in the river is going. So you don't need to get down to hyper analysis and into sort of reductive analysis that misses the, the forest for the trees, as they say, um, you can say, oh, I think this flock is gonna turn this way. I think this river or this business trend is gonna go this way without either going too reductionist or being sort of fuzzily holistic. Um, so if you can look for uh, loops and emergence uh, in different, different systems around you in, in your life, I think you're gonna be a long way towards having an intuitive understanding of, of how systems work. Awesome, loops and emergence. That I'm, I'm just absorbing that because it's so good. So let's end on that with more concrete examples. Sure. I, who doesn't love examples? So we already talked about the thermostat, right? That's a simple loop. And the goal is homeostasis at a particular. Exactly. Yeah. Which means, you know, changing things till you achieve, uh, you know, a set point that you can hold. What's a more complex uh, set of loops that, that's not just that simple, but is a little more complex that brings to life these ideas around emergence? Let me talk about a couple. Um, the first, we can look at, at how um, different animals in the wild interact. Um, so we have here you know, like lynxes and rabbits. Um, this is a, a, a classic of both mathematical modeling and, and, uh, and systems modeling. The idea being here that uh, lynx eat hares or rabbits, and um, the more hares there are, the more lynxes you can have because you're supporting the population. And you might think that this population would oscillate down to just, like you said, a homeostasis where it sort of evens out. But it turns out that doesn't happen. What we see instead of these, these, this roller coaster where you have a dramatic increase in the lynxes and then they, they crash because there aren't enough rabbits and the rabbits increase and then the lynxes follow them. So there are some, the, the emergent nature of this here is the cyclical nature. So if, for example, this again, just to relate this back to something more, more business-like, if I saw my business crashing and I realized, oh, you know, is this a terrible thing we're about to go out of business? Or uh, is it just that um, in my business, you know, our sales really slow down at the end of the year? So it's not, not to worry. In January, February, things will pick back up again. This happens every year. If I understand the underlying system dynamics, then I um, then I can I'll, I'll have a, a big, again a better grasp of that. Um, beyond the lynxes and hares, we can also look at um, overall ecologies like uh, wolves and how they affect um, the overall ecology they exist in. Uh, this diagram actually comes from a, a terrific video on on how wolves change climate that I encourage people to look for and, and watch. Um, and there's several points here. One is how you have multiple different actors in this case animals and, and plants all interacting with each other to make an overall ecosystem. And one of the predictions that happened uh, in the early 90s when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone Park was that they would just you know, crash the ecosystem. And it turned out that wasn't true at all. In fact, they, the ecosystem became far more vibrant because they were acting at, at what we call a leverage point where they were able to change the behavior of deer and elk, which then changed the, the behavior and the growth patterns of other plants and animals that eventually ended up in having the rivers themselves meander less and be clearer, which brought in more beavers and fish. And it's, it's a wonderful ecological story. 
But this is a great way and a great example of, of looking at things from a systemic point of view, rather than just saying wolves eat deer, so therefore that's bad, we shouldn't introduce wolves. Um, we need to look at things more broadly and with more understanding of the, of the interconnections between them. Mike, you're sharing with us these ideas around ecosystems. And I think a lot of us here are game designers or we love game design and we're wanting to put it into our products. So can you talk about how these uh, nature-based systems, which are incredibly valuable to study and understand, can we, you build a bridge to games like, you know, battle resources loops, feedback progression loops, all those things. Sure. How how do you 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 now after doing MMO design and being a real pioneer, you're now the director of game design at Indiana University, bringing up the next generation of game designers. So, talk to us about feedback loops and emergence in game systems. Well, it's funny. I, I often start with some of these ecological examples in my in my courses, and I think the students for the first little while are a little bit mystified because they're like, "I thought this was a game design course. Why are we talking about wolves and rivers?" But it all applies. And one of the things I'm trying to show them is that to be a systems thinker means that you are looking for and finding systems all around you. And if you start doing that as a game designer in particular, you can take game systems that you find in different parts of the world or in other games and reapply them in different ways uh, in, in your own games. So, um, for example, we were talking about just about in the, the wolves and rivers a moment ago. Um, we have three primary systems or types of systems that we talk about in games, um, engines, economies, and ecologies. And so a game ecology may not involve animals at, at all. What it tends to involve are different kinds of, of resources balancing each other out. Um, and we can look, for example, at another aspect of, of game design that we see all over the place, which is the core loop, and look at some games that have both, um, this, is, this is a great one, um, that, that have, um, this is a, a core um, progression loop. But let's look at one that has uh, both PVE and PVP. And what we mean by this is player versus environment and player versus player. This is a, a hybrid or, or dual core loop where you have the players being able to act in ways uh, to reinforce their own success and their own, their own behavior in a, in a player versus environment loop. And then if they want to, in a player versus player loop. Each part of this loop has different things that are reinforcing the, the player's success, but also balancing it, sort of acting as, as friction or, or pushback on it. Um, so we can take, the, I mean, this is actually a, you can trace a, an ecology straight to this kind of a loop uh, in game design. Um, we might also look at uh, the example of, of if I have a, a, a game about being a ship captain or running, you know, running a, a Navy, um, I would draw a loop very much like this. This is actually a modified one from a game that I designed some time ago uh, where you were a ship captain, you had to rely on your crew and you had to you know, fight and take the prizes uh, to, to build up your, your ships again. And so it's that at outermost loop that may be at first glance almost invisible here, but it's really important that the, that the gameplay and the game loop close back on itself. So if I'm the captain of the ship, I have certain things I can do to help the crew and help the ship. And then that has to feed back to me. And one of the things that we uh, work very hard with our students, um, and I realize in my own past work as a user, user interface designer, for example, I, I did this just less consciously at the time, is to close that loop. So what we often say is that you don't really have a game until you have that first closed loop where the, the player can do something in the game, see some effect, get some feedback, and then have that come back to them to change their future intentions and, and future mental model. Um, so the player said, feedback loop, the right? The player feedback loop, exactly right, yeah. Um, so that 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 is uh, the key thing, really, I think, in a lot of different kinds of product design, but certainly in game design, where I do something in the game, I get feedback from the game, and that then changes my next intention, helps me build my mental model of the game. That's gameplay. And until you have that, you don't have a system, and you don't really have a game. So that's something that we that we push a lot. And I may start with wolves and rivers, but eventually it comes back to, okay, you're going to have a ship battle, or you're going to be swinging a sword and fighting a monster. Or I have had some kinds of some some uh, uh, some players who make games about ecology. So this is a, a a simplified, very simplified version, showing the player having their own mental model, their own systems going on inside their head, 
as a player, you give input into the into the game. The game then does something complex internally as well. If and then that provides you feedback to the player, which then helps them or allows them to update their mental model. It's important that both of those sides, the player and the and the game, have complex systems going on inside them. If every time I gave a, a particular input, the game gave the very same output, I wouldn't really build a mental model of that, and it wouldn't seem like much of an experience. Now, this one is is really fascinating to me because it is I, I, I've labeled this here as the game designer feedback loop. But really, this is the product designer loop, where as a product designer, inevitably what you're doing is watching your users or your players, if you're a game designer, use your product, get feedback from that product, adjust how they use it. I might change how I hold a tool or how I apply it. And as a product designer, what I have to do is watch that whole system, that whole process, and adjust my design of the product to better fit what the, what the user or player is looking for. This is also a great example of how whenever we find systems, we find them in multiple layers. So we have the systems going on inside the player and the game here, and then the system of the game and the player together. And then outside of that, we have yet another system of the designer and the game plus player system. So we have these multiple levels. And one of the things that we, we see a lot in as game designers, and I think just as systems thinkers, is finding this ability to look at multiple levels of the system at any given point, sort of like zooming in and out of your focus. So I can say, what's the player thinking at this moment? What's their intention? Or what's happening in the game at this moment? What's what's going on there? Zoom that and say, okay, so what feedback is the game giving? All right, how does that affect the player? And then zoom out again and say, how does it affect me as, as a designer, that feedback from that system? So I will now change the game to be slightly different and give the player a different experience. And again, this generalizes out to all different kinds of product design, whether you're designing, you know, hammers or medical scanners. It, it really is the same process. I love that. It's a key skill for product owners, for product leaders to be able to do that zooming in and out. Exactly. So you're right. It isn't just for game designers. It's for all product designers. What goes wrong in product <laughs> design and game design if you don't understand systems? Oh, everything. Uh, let me let me narrow that down just a little bit. Um, if if you don't have um, if you don't have a system in your game or in, in your product, uh, you're not really going to have. Uh, was, excuse me. Particularly with games, you won't have a game if you don't have a system there. Um, there are a lot of. Uh, I see this a lot with my students, where or with young game designers, where they will build something, and we we tend to call it a toy. It's like this is an interesting, fun little thing. What would I do with it? Why would I play with this for more than a moment? Or again, in terms of a non-game uh, tool or, or app, why would I use this for, for more than just a moment, put it down and go, oh, that's all right, but there's nothing really there. There has to be enough of a system in the game in particular that enables me to build a mental model. So I can say, oh, this is, I understand why I would want to do this and what I would want to do next. I have enough feedback from the game that I can say, okay, now I know something more than I did a moment ago. Let me try this and see what happens. Oh, look, an interesting thing happened. And that's where we get that systemic loop. If we don't have that loop, then you don't have an experience and so you don't have a game. And really, I think what this comes down to is that if you, that all games are systems and if you don't have a system, you aren't gonna have a game. Um, we do sometimes see uh, visual novels, for example, where people will just press the space bar and go through the, you know, the novel that way, but that's not really a game. It's completely linear. You're not looping back on yourself. There's no mental model that's changing what you as a player do. Um, and again, I think this is true in, in any product design where um, your users want to feel more competent. They want to feel more mastery over time. And if they get adequate and appropriate feedback from your product, that helps them say, oh, great. I now understand more about how to use this than I did 10 minutes ago. So I'm better off and I'm more likely to keep using the, the, the product. Can you say a little bit more about how you integrate formulating a strong mental model into this? Because you mentioned that. And that's something my clients struggle with a lot is why and how that's exactly useful. And I think part of it is the simplification that's needed for systems design. I think there's a, a real correspondence between whatever system you set up in the game, or again, it could be a general app, but especially for games, um, and the mental model that you are helping the player build. Um, if you um, metaphorically dump a load of bricks into the player's head, that's not gonna form a model. 
but if you give them a few bricks and you say, oh, look, here's a doorway and here's a window, pretty soon they're going to say, oh, look, this starts to look like a house. And a house is not just a pile of bricks. It is a pile of bricks with a model, with a, a structure. Um, so a lot of what we try and do with games and why onboarding for any product, again, but for games in particular, is so crucial is because you're, you're taking the player from the point where they know nothing about what they're doing and what their goals need to be or, or how they need to act in this, in this game world. <clears throat> and you give them little bits of comprehensible feedback to the point that they can incorporate them, begin to build a, a, a mental model out of them, and then test them in the game. And again, one of the key things we see that goes wrong sometimes is someone will test something out saying, oh, I'm going to try this. And what they get back is not at all the feedback they expect. A little bit of surprise is a good thing if it, again, helps them learn something. But if it's completely contrary or if it is contradictory to what they've learned before, that harms their mental model, harms their comprehension of what they're doing, and make it, makes it less likely they're going to continue using the, the game or, or the app. Um, so this is the more comprehensible your internal systems model is in your game, and the more that that maps directly to the player's mental model, the better off you are. And this, again, argues for having a, a clear understanding as you're making the game rather than just kind of throwing things, you know, throwing a bunch of bricks into a pot and hoping that a, a house pops out because that that almost never happens. So can you give us a concrete example of that? Would like the battle resources loop be an example of that? Sure. There's I mean, you can look at any um, any game that is successful or not successful and really point out systemic you know, wins or systemic problems. If I. Um, in like in a, in a combat example, if there's if there's resources that I need, um, and here's sorry, here's a classic one. Uh, there is a monster that you have to fight in the game to get past the next door to get to the next level or whatever. This monster uh, requires a magic weapon to kill it, but this monster is also guarding the first magic weapon you're going to see in the game. There's no way for the player to get past that, and that's a simple resource collision uh, and, and systemic misunderstanding. Or if um, you can expand that out and say, you've taught the player by the last three monsters that they fought how to fight them. That you've, you, you, know, you could say this is a color-based combat system. You have to go red, then green, then blue. And with the next one, suddenly you have to use yellow. Well, they've never seen yellow before. They don't, they don't have any, that's not in their mental model. And that will be considered to be a, a, a failure on the, on the player's part because now you're requiring of them things they haven't seen and can't extrapolate. Now, there is a bit of, of alchemy there in that um, uh, you want sometimes to have the players be able to extrapolate somewhat. And, and what that somewhat is really depends on the player. So um, it's a little bit like having an exam uh, in, in a, you know, a science class or something where my teachers used to always tell me, we're not going to give you the same problems you had on, on the homework. These are ones that are going to be similar to that. So if, uh, if you've taught the player hey, you can mix um, you know, blue and red and make purple, but you haven't taught them that you can mix red and, and green and make yellow, but maybe they should be able to understand that. Then maybe with that, that they should be able to extrapolate that. And then that, if they can, that feels like a win to them because they've said, oh, I built this, I, I used what I knew my mental model that these two colors combine this way. I bet if I combine these two colors, they'll combine a new way that gives me you know, uh, something new that I can do in the game. When that happens, player feels, players feel a tremendous sense of satisfaction and mastery. Oh, that's such a good example. Yeah, and what you're pointing out is that a lot of mental models come down to an implicit rule set. Yes, very what, much. You know, it's what, what do I know from interacting in this world that I could use to make assumptions about what the right thing to do is and how to behave? Right. Exactly. And, and what the possibility space looks like. And what's fascinating to me about that, too, is that uh, when I play games, sometimes I'm naturally enough looking for the systems in them. But sometimes the people who design them weren't designing them as consciously as I would like. So um, we sometimes talk about leverage points where you can say, I want to tweak the system here because I think it'll have a disproportionate effect elsewhere. If that's my mental model, because I understand how systems work, but that's not what the game designer had in mind, that might not work. And suddenly I go, oh, they weren't really thinking this from a systems point of view. That's always a little bit unfortunate from my point of view, because it's also very intuitive to have, you know, if I if I make better soldiers over here, then I'm going to get a, a, a disproportionate effect over there. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't happen. And that's that's kind of too bad. So this is kind of blowing my mind because it's so interesting and yet so grounded. I want to know, how did you 
learn to design and tune systems. That could be, you know, a five hour thing, but yeah. <laughs> at a high level, how did you learn? Cause so much of it's tuning, right? And all that stuff over time. And how are you now teaching people how to learn? And then we can drill down on some specifics. Sure. So I really learned, I guess, by the school of hard knocks. I mean, in, in that I, I encountered these, I started designing games on my own in high school and college and really didn't have any guides for this. There wasn't a lot written about game design at that point, uh, and certainly not very much about systems design. I, I encountered uh, Danella Meadows' book on, on systems thinking, and it didn't quite gel with me at, at the time. Um, so I didn't really understand or encounter formal systems thinking until much, much later. But you know, about the same time, I was learning to work on cars, and I, my one of my first cars was a Volkswagen that I I learned to tune by hand, and it really came down to learning to just hearing it sound right, and it was very difficult to describe what that sounded like, but I knew it when I hit it, and so there's been a lot of that in my in my work of tuning an economic system or tuning my my car's valve timing, so it just sounds right. Um, that's um, that's been very satisfying, but it also takes a lot of time and it becomes very difficult to articulate. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why I wrote my book is because I wanted to try and, I, just by going through the process of writing this, I thought I'd be able to articulate it better. That's what I'm trying to do now with my students is to help them approach this, certainly from a practical point of view, but also from a more theoretical or theory-informed theory view. Um, and I think we're making a lot of progress. It's It's exciting to me because this is a great time where we're building a lot of game design theory that we just haven't had in the past. And a lot of us have kind of known it intuitively, but we haven't been able to talk about it in really clear terms. And of course, I think there's a strong benefit to my students and to society, because if we can help them see systems and build systems in games, hopefully they'll be able to do that more generally in, in their lives outside of games as well. So your story is a story of learning through projects. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, how are you, how do you understand how to teach game design? How do, what role do doing projects play versus the formal learning? They play a really crucial role. Um, we start off, of course, with lots of small projects um, and we do end up with sort of a, a, a masterwork for our students uh, where they spend the last year and a half or so on a very large project. They, they work in teams and they end up actually publishing their game uh, commercially. So we, we put a lot of stock in project-based learning. However, there has to be some theoretical underpinning and theoretical background uh, to, that, to that project work. Otherwise, they're just kind of flailing. What's interesting to me is that um, we see the theory and, and systems thinking cropping up in different ways. So certainly a game design. Okay, your game has an economy here. You're going to need to design that. But also in how they work together as a team. We bring together teams of um, you know, six to 12 students of really different backgrounds. And they all have to work to, with each other, not just for a week or for six weeks, but like I said, for many months, like with any professional team. And we try and help them surface and analyze and tweak the systems that are in their own team to work more efficiently. Um, and that's that's an ongoing project uh, and, and process. Uh, what, what I often say is that uh, you know, when a team is having a very difficult time, I tell them, look, if you can learn the things that you're learning now at age 20 or 22 instead of 30 or 32, you're doing really, really well. I, I think that helps them sometimes. Oh, that is great. Well, I have a bunch more questions, but a flood of questions has come in. Uh, we have a question from Sajith Kumar. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Which game can business managers use to develop their strategy skills? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, so there's a lot of them. But one thing I'd say is no matter what game or games you play, um, I think there's sort of a three part of this. First is get everyone ready. Have everyone understand the game. Play the game. Play the game several times. And then talk about it. And talk about what systems you found in the game that you that are just fun. And, hey, that was cool. But also, how can we apply this to, to our own situation? So, for example... An easy one is, a, and most of these, by the way, are going to be tabletop games because they do translate so well. The systems are right on the surface because there's no computer that they can hide behind. The computer is the player. So there's a game called Power Grid that is about uh, building an electrical power grid in Germany. Uh, when I brought this game home, my kids looked at me like, really? That's what we're going to play? But that's now a, a staple in our household. Um, another one along uh, sort of similar is Terraforming Mars, which is about terraforming Mars. Um, Kind of on the other end, there's a game called Seven Wonders, which is a tabletop game that is about building your own ancient civilization. 
all three of these games have very different but really recognizable and comprehensible systems in them that will, with a little bit of work on your part, will help you say, how can we apply this to, to our situation? Now, everyone's office and, and business and product situation is going to be different, and there's, you're going to have different issues there. Um, one more I'll mention, and that's uh, Pandemic, uh, which is a cooperative game. Um, or actually, one more, <laughs> maybe even better than Pandemic, is a game called Burgle Bros or Burgle Brothers, where in, in Pandemic, you are a team trying to overcome a, a, a series of global pandemics. In Burgle Brothers, you are a sort of an Ocean's Eleven kind of crew trying to break into a building. Both these games are notable that they are completely cooperative. Everyone has to work together. And that, again, can teach you an awful lot about where what it means to be part of a team, what it means to use your superpower on a team, and what it means to sometimes step, step aside and let someone else shine a little bit. Um, these are all fantastic games I think will do great for anyone in, in an office or product situation. Awesome. We're going to make sure to link them later in the comments on this um, on this live stream. So thank you so much, Mike. We have another question from Frank Ramirez, who asks, what tactics do you use to prevent boredom and churn? Oh, boy, that's a great question. <laughs> we have hours for this, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so boredom is generally a, a sign that, that uh, the player is not engaged, that they're... Um, and I will put that engagement at multiple levels. Again, this is chapter four of my book. Um, but you can look at um, players being engaged perceptually on a, a sub-second level. So is something interesting happening in front of them on the board, in the, on the screen, whatever it is they're doing? And then are they engaged cognitively, emotionally, psycho uh, uh, excuse me, socially, uh, and even culturally? And you can look at each of these different levels. And there's some really fascinating work that's been done on how to engage people either in that fast action kind of way or in the slower uh, emotional, social, and cultural kinds of way, and, and that there are limits to both of those things. So there's something that, that I refer to as the interactivity budget, where you need to have the player be interacting with the game and have some feedback from the game. So the player's making their mental model, trying something new out. You need to have all that happening. But if it's all happening in sub-second or you know, one or two-second basis, then they're not going to have a lot of time for, for pausing and thinking about what they're doing. On the other hand, if you have a game that is very, very deeply strategic, a game like uh, Europa Universalis is, is a, a great heavyweight, very strategic game, then you don't have a lot of fast action going on because people just can't handle both of those. Uh, and it turns out there's some, some really great data on this. Um, again, that's, that's in the book uh, from a, a group called Quantic Foundry that uh, has done a lot of survey work on this. So uh, engagement is, is primarily, um, is there enough going on and is the player being able to use some but not too much of their mental resources. Um, and then um, if you are doing that in a way that isn't just purely short term, to get to the second part of the question here, where you're giving them some longer term things to think about, some longer term goals, maybe even some things to think about emotionally. How do I feel about this? That reduces churn dramatically. Where we see churn is where you have people who are engaged for a moment and then the moment's gone. It's a little bit like eating cotton candy. You know, that's Great for a few seconds if you're over the age of 12. And then and then you're kind of done and you don't want to keep eating cotton candy. That's not going to, to do a lot for you. You have to give them something a little meatier, so to speak, uh, to uh, to have in their heads to bring them to, to, to come back so they won't just churn out of your product. It's a different way to design. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's a, and what you're talking about is a strategy, not just tactics. Yes. Right? It's, it's really a... Yeah. It's a strategy of creating a journey for your player, not very just like so. manipulating them with rewards. And and very much as you've written and talked about the the player's journey is is it, that's exactly right. Now I realize that the, this was about tactics, and there are many many smaller tactics that we could get into, but that that requires a lot more time, I'm afraid. And by the way, so much of this is in Mike's book, and that's why we're here. <laughs> we're also here to share a bunch of great stuff for free with you. So thanks for being here. So. We have another question from Tiago from Brazil. What do you recommend as a tool to model the loops in your games to help balance them out? Is machination still a good alternative? So machinations is great. First of all, there's a new version of machinations out. This is by a tool by uh, Joris Dormans that is, is a terrific tool. Uh, he has a, 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 he had an old flash version that isn't up anymore and he has a new version that's out that, that's quite good. Uh, there's also a tool uh, by Nikki Case called Loopy uh, that's a little simpler. Uh, actually, it's a lot simpler, but but it's it's not bad um, for for early you know early loops. 
what I've found with machinations, both in my own work and in teaching it, is that it is great for certain kinds of resource-bound games. If I'm making a, a strategy game or a game where I'm um, you know, chopping a lot of wood and getting a lot of stone, trying to build buildings, those sorts of resource chains, then uh, machinations can be great, and it really is a wonderful tool. But it's also very limited, and I think you need to be careful that it doesn't limit your thinking at the design stage of a game. Honestly, the best tool, and I've tried many of them, the best tool for me still is just a whiteboard. Um, I, I often end up at the end of an hour design session with you know black ink on the, on the side of my hand because I just, I'm too impatient to get to the eraser, so I just erase them with the side of my hand. Um, but that kind of analog tool is, is really still the best. Um, that said, once I get something kind of worked out on, on the board, and that does take a long time, don't underestimate how long it's gonna take you to have a good set of loops on a whiteboard. I might then take it to machinations and model out the dynamic behavior of the system to make sure that, that things work really well. Um, I know that uh, I have caught myself and my students uh, in, a, in a small, building a small game that works and you kind of know you're onto something when you just keep playing the machinations version. Uh, so that's a good sign, but it's not, it's not the first tool I would turn to, but it certainly is a good one. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that very concrete and actionable uh, advice, wonderful. So we have something from Ron V who asks, what's a good heuristic or something to keep in mind when you're tuning? Oh boy. For those who aren't as used to tuning. Um, there's a couple that, uh, one that I believe came, uh, came from Sid Meier, which is that if something is going wrong, this is, the system is there, but it's broken and something's not working. And first of all, this happens to everybody. So don't, the first heuristic is don't make the mistake of saying I'm a bad designer. That's not the case. Every system is terrible when it starts out. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll plug Ed, Cat, Ed Catmull's uh, book, uh, Creativity Inc., where he talks about how their Pixar scripts are all terrible when they start out. Same thing with systems. So one thing that Sid Meier said was double it or half it. If you have a value, you know, I've got something where the, um, the rate this factory is producing widgets is 10, and that's not right. I'm either going to make it 20 or 5. I might make it 50. I'm just try something kind of outlandish because you, you, it's going to be broken. It won't be any more broken than it is now. Or if it is, you'll learn something by doing that. What you're trying to do is to converge towards a solution. So you're not going to converge towards a solution by going from 10 to 11 or 10 down to 9. That's not going to give you enough information. You really want to look for where does this thing fall off? Where does this, the system completely break down? Okay, now let's retreat from that. Retreat halfway back or go again halfway as big, or, you know, twice as big. Um, what I found is that by doing this sort of stepwise approach, you can get to a um, you do two things. You get to a, to a valid place in your in your system where like, okay, this value or these set of the set of values seems to work. The other thing is you can uh, jump over local minima or local maxima. This is a, a problem in in artificial intelligence and a lot of data modeling, where you might have a system that sort of settles into a local well, and you think, oh well, that's that's great, that's the best it can be, but if you had the, the way they talk about it in AI is throwing a little more energy into the system to, to try some broader values, you might find uh, a, an even better bet value, a more global minimum or global optimum rather than a local one. But that requires taking some adventurous steps and saying, well, you know, this value at 10 doesn't work. Let's make it 100 and see what happens. Wow, that was crazy. That didn't work at all. Okay, let's back it off to 50. Okay, no, 20. And then you go, okay, maybe 15. How about 17? Now you're starting to zero in on, on where you want to be. Um, there are, um, in any kind of new system, any kind of new game system or um, uh, you know, product system, I tend to be really skeptical of um, sort of mathematically closed techniques. And they, so all the techniques that I have are very heuristically based like this. So it's kind of messy uh, and things will be broken for a while, but ultimately what you, if you can see that convergence, you know you're on the right path. So in a way, what that comes down to is making mistakes enthusiastically and aggressively. <laughs> yes. Very Knowing cool. that it's going to be terrible at the beginning, make make some big shifts. Yes, exactly. And they don't have to be great. right. They just have to teach you something. Exactly right. And what that's doing is, teach, is, is, is affecting your designer's mental model of the system you're making. So you're building your mental model just like a player will be later on. So it is completely the opposite of cranking out ready to ship pixel perfect uh, page designs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we, like I said before, we try and get our students to having uh, a complete loop as fast as possible. We sometimes talk about the dumbest possible version. 
you know, what's the, what's how fast can I get to something that shows me that loop? And I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how dumb it looks. And it's funny. I have to tell, I have students working on a game where you're flying a plane. And I said, just give me a cube in the air. And they really wanted to model the plane. Like, no, 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 don't model a plane, just a cube. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. So we have another question, another one from Frank Ramirez. Oh, this is a juicy one. I might jump in on this one too. So how do you define the difference between casual games and more advanced games? Wow, that okay. I definitely hear your answer to this. That, and casual, is there a system angle? Right? Um, I think so. So casual is really a fraught term in, in a lot of ways. Here's how I would put it: um, casual games tend to have shorter-term loops with very light long-term loops. You look at something like Candy Crush. The short-term loop is get past this level. The longer-term loop is oh, I want to get further down my 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 timeline here. But that's not a very strong goal. There's nothing, you're not even trying to save a princess or whatever. You just, you know, move the, the train along. So it's very, very light. It doesn't require a lot of mental resources. And you can think of it as, can I play this game on a 10 minute bus ride? If, if I can, then it's probably a casual game. Um, one thing that the a mistake that we make sometimes is thinking casual players aren't invested psychologically in a game, aren't, or aren't engaged, or aren't gonna come back. And none of those things are true. They can be very, very invested they're just not really, you know, burning their brains to 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 make the game or to you know, create their mental model and, and to be engaged in the game. It doesn't require that much of their of their mental resources. So it's it's the difference between, you know, uh, reading a, a difficult textbook in the evening versus reading some light fiction. Uh, both may be engaging, but the light fiction is far more casual, and you know, because your mental resources may be depleted by the end of the day. Um, so I think you can also look at things like. Um, Casual games tend to have brighter, simpler graphics, um, less photorealism or less realistic de depictions of things. Um, again, they're just easier to approach. And um, finally, the last thing I'd say is that they are much, much easier to learn. I can learn a casual game in you know just a few moves uh, of, of whatever that means in the game. And I have that loop very quickly where I understand I have a pretty good outline of the mental model of the game. So. Um, uh, Angry Birds, the the loop, the feedback loop there for me to understand what's going on in the game is really simple. And I think they do the tutorial in like three images. And so that's that's a great example of an engaging, you know, highly engaging, very casual game. Amy Jo, I'm, I'm very interested in, in your thoughts on this too. I love what you said. I think those are great things. How hard is it to learn? How much of your mental resources does it take? Um, et cetera. How... Uh, Maybe how much of your day do you spend? Because there might be a... So the, the main thing I wanted to add to what you're saying is that it's not just one or the other, casual or advanced. There's also mid-core. And mid-core is a term that really came up in the last, what, 10 years, Mike? Eight years? And mid-core games are... They have elements of casual and elements of harder core. And so now, like, I just finished a casual game project. And we talked about, well, how mid-core do we want to go with this? And we talked about that balance. And all as a game team, we talked about all the issues that Mike just laid out. You know, how hard does this make this to learn? Can we like dole the learning out over time? How complex are these systems? That's the other thing. Casual games tend to have very simple systems, maybe a few interlocking simple systems. But in the mid-core games, you'll see more complex systems, layered systems, maybe more loops within loops. Really interesting example is Hello Nikki, which is a female fashion RPG out of China that's total mid-core with a huge worldwide fast-growing population. So girls do play mid-core. They do indeed. For the right game. And I'll give a couple examples from the board game world, the tabletop world. There's two games, I mentioned Seven Wonders already, which I'd say is very mid-core. Uh, but there's another game called Sushi Go, which is a great, fun little game about collecting sushi. And it's very cute. It's a very sweet game. Both games use have, have the primary mechanic is the same, where you, you have a hand of cards. You play one card and, and hand all your cards off to the person next to you. It's kind of unusual. And, you know, I've taught people to play both these games. I can teach people to play Sushi Go inside of five minutes. It's very simple and very enjoyable. It's engaging, but definitely casual. Sometimes what I'll do with, with people who don't play a lot of games, so we'll play a round of that, and then we'll bring out Seven Wonders. There's a lot more depth, a lot more going into Seven Wonders. The first game of that may take them a little while to get into it. By the second game, they totally have it. 
So there's a, a clear difference there, like a gradient, I think, not a, not a binary state like Amy Jo is saying, but there's a gradient from super casual down to mid-core and, and hardcore games beyond that. Right. So, uh, oh, wow, more questions. Let's, uh, let's bang through these. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. This is really oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, Alessandro asks, about game balancing, is there a data science model? Is there some special methodology? And is the answer, uh, get your book? <laughs> <laughs> no, for real though, like game the, the, balancing, it's again, it's really, it's challenging. So it is very challenging. What is there? And so there, is that why you wrote your book? Yeah, there are, there's not a turnkey solution to game balancing. Um, there are some tools that will really help you. Um, a clear understanding of, of Excel or spreadsheets is is required. That's something that, again, you know, some of my students get kind of uh, a, a shocked look on their face when I say they have to know Excel. Like, really? Why? Well, because you're going to be doing a lot with different kinds of mathematical curves and things like that. Understanding the difference between linear, piecewise linear, polynomial, and, and quadratic curves or exponential curves, which, again, I, I, I go through my there book. Um my wife is a former math teacher, and I was I was edging up on this when reading. It. I thought, can I really do this? And she said, you have to do this. It would be a disservice not to. So I go through all of that because it is so incredibly necessary. If you can understand why it is that an exponential curve always looks flat where you are, wherever you are on the curve, and looks like it goes to, up to a cliff in the distance, and how you can apply that in game design, you can understand balancing much, much more easily. Um, and understand that, you know, having values like we see in idle games where this, you know, one thing costs 10 and another thing costs 10 billion. And that's OK, because how the game is balanced. It all depends on which curves you're using and why. Um, but there's again, there's no turnkey solution. There's no um, analytic solution. Um, data analytics, by the way, is, is tremendous and of, of tremendous use in games. But it's a tool that you use, not a design methodology. Right. So just to build on that. Something I've done on multiple games as a system designer is build the Excel models, run them, put it into the game, look at the stats, go back to the Excel model, tweak a few things, right? It's like, <laughs> over, that, and that's over, where over the data again, yeah. comes in is like, you know, you're, right? So we have another question, which is very juicy. Do you think gamification is more related to psychology or game design? Oh, and why? Yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is take yeah. it away, Mike. <laughs> uh, gamification has a lot of great uses, and I think a lot of um, times when people are trying to sort of force fit it, and it doesn't always work. Um, clearly, there's a lot of psychology at, at play there because you're dealing with with people uh, and dealing with trying to help people do things they might not otherwise do. Uh, I'm a big fan of Duolingo. I have no affiliation with them, except that I'm learning Swedish and French. Uh, and their system works pretty well you know, for me. Um, there are other gamified systems that are either lightly or heavily gamified that work pretty well. But um, I guess the way I would say this is there's a lot of psychology involved because there's a lot of psychology involved in game design. Um, with all my game design students, I really want them to understand perception and cognition, some amount of social psychology at minimum. doesn't mean you have to have a degree in these things, but you have to have some uh, understanding of them, even developmental and other kinds of psychology as well. So when you're talking about a gamified product, um, you need to understand a few things about uh, the, the psychology of the people that are involved that are using it. But beyond that, uh, we used to talk about user-centered design, which I think now is just part of overall UI UX. Thinking about things like, why is someone using this product? What's the context in which they're using it? If I'm using a product uh, in, a, in a very time sensitive way where I have my boss breathing down my neck or I need to get something done in a very short amount of time, gamifying that's gonna be very difficult and very different than if it's something I can kind of do when I want to. So I mentioned Duolingo, I can spend five or 10 minutes on that or half an hour if I want to, but nothing bad is gonna happen if I don't get my words right or if I don't complete a lesson. Um, one of the things with games that I think makes them unique and to me really fascinating is that no one has to play a game which means that if I'm designing a game, it is incumbent on me to make this game from the very first time you see it, from its first call to action, which is probably just an image, as compelling as possible. And then it has to be, continue to be compelling all along the way. Because at any moment you'll say, you know what, this isn't very fun or it's not engaging enough, I'm gonna put it down and do something else. With non-game products, we almost always have some reason where we have to use them. If I'm handed a new accounting system, I'm gonna, you know, my boss says, hey, you gotta use this. Well, then I have to use it. 
Um, and gamifying it may help me. It may help me get on board. It may help me learn the ins and outs of the system, but it's not going to help me feel like, hey, I'm playing a game now. So you need to really keep that in mind. And that's that's psychology, game design, but certainly product design. Absolutely. And just building on Duolingo, I think something a lot of people miss about what makes Duolingo so compelling isn't all the mechanics. The mechanics are icing on the cake and they're great and they do a good job with them. What actually is the hard part, which is the hard part of game design, is the structured progression of small yes. challenges. Yes. yes. It's actually the content design. And they it, and is so good and so tuned to go back yes. to the issue of tuning. It's always at the right level of challenge for you. And, and all the mechanics are in service of that. And right. so many people with gamification just try and throw the mechanics on, but they don't have an engaging activity that gets better over time as you get better. And that is exactly right. And this is why, you know, putting a badge on it doesn't really help. If the badge is indicative of something that I've done where I've had a success and my mental model's been correct, that's great. I feel terrific. Mental model. Yeah. Otherwise, I feel like, well, okay, the badge doesn't really mean anything to me. Yes. So um, we only have time for a few more questions. Uh, I have one, which is you have this amazing opportunity to interact with students coming into the game design program and going out into the world. You know, what is it that your students are excited about? What trends or technologies or just issues are they excited and passionate about? Give us a glimpse into that. You know, that's a really terrific question. They have so many diverse interests. Um, one of the advanced classes that I teach, uh, we start off where every student has to pitch. And so we have, you know, 30 some students in there. So we end up with like 30 ish pitches in there because sometimes they pair up right off the bat and we winnow that down to eight pitches or so by the end. And then we hold a big uh, pitch session at the end of this, at the end of the semester. I never know what they're going to come up with. And it always surprises me. And it's uh, it's just great. Cause it's a little bit like opening presents. It's like, I have no idea what they're going to talk about. Sometimes um, you know, many of them want to have, want to tell a compelling story. And I have to kind of talk them past that. Not that stories or narrative are, are bad or, or anything like that, but that this has to be an experience that the player can have. And that one of the things I try and help them understand is that they aren't building the experience, they're building an experience for the player. Everyone's going to approach this differently. But they have a meaningful story that they want the player to experience, and that's fantastic. Um, sometimes they they will latch on to a particular emotion. Again, we try and get uh, past some of the, the easy ones like fear or anger or uh, overpowering others. These are kind of uh, things have been done a whole lot, maybe way too much in games, but uh, an emotion like longing or hope in a dark time, or I'm trying to think some of the other themes we've, we've had. Um, we we have a, a game that my, some of my students are working on now where the, the emotional resonance they're trying to get to is, you know, something is uh, essentially a crime has been committed. Something very wrong has happened and you can never make it right, but you can help make it righter than it is. And so they're going for something very subtle there. Um, we have had some of them uh, take a more ecological approach, uh, like I mentioned. Um, they all become interested in, in the systems approach at one point or another. Uh, one of the things we talk about as a, an opposition to the systems approach is what uh, we, we sometimes call the content furnace, where you're just trying to you know, throw more and more content into the game in hopes that something in there is going to be engaging. It's like shoveling coal into a big furnace, and you're, you're never going to be able to sustain that for long. Um, so we have we have everything from right now. Let's see. Um, like I said, this the story about a you know a, a crime has been committed in effect. And you're trying to make it better uh, to uh, a bunch of woodland friends who are trying to make their community better by putting on a winter festival together. Um, and there's some opposition, some things that happens there. Uh, one where you are the plane. When I talked about you, you are a, a, a pilot trying to fly different supplies around to different parts of the island to help the island after a storm. So there's just a, a huge variety of games. And like I said, one of the great joys of, of my job is that I never know what they're going to come up with next. Uh, and you know, really rarely a week goes by when a student doesn't come in my office and say, "I've got a great idea for a game. Hear me out on this one." And you know, I always try to because you never know where the great next great ideas are going to come from. Exactly. So just about out of time, but one more question has come in. Again, Mike, thank you so much for your time. And thank you all for your questions. That's really what makes this fun for us. So Alessandra asks, what technology or trend do you think will change gamification for sure? Virtual reality, internet of things, some other thing? What's your sense of that? 
Um, I think Internet of Things is huge, but I think it's going to come at us in ways we don't quite expect. Um, I don't think it's going to be um, necessarily toothbrushes that tell when we've brushed our teeth enough. Um, but, um, you know, if I have um, if I have a product line and I want people to buy uh, 10 of my products, maybe if I can tell that through RFID or things like that, that you have bought seven of them, I'm going to give you a massive discount on the last three to encourage you to buy them. Um, that's a, just a, a light amount of game design and gamification in in product purchase and product use. Um, I think we're going to see great things from augmented reality. I'm still very bullish on that for the long term. I think it's going to be, you know, we're, we've had a few stumbles recently. Um, what I've said for a long time is that uh, I think virtual reality is great and is going to have some niches that it uses very well, but that overall it's sort of the opening act for augmented reality. Um, the idea that I can see different parts of the world differently with a virtual world overlaid on the real world, I think is very, very powerful. Uh, maybe too powerful. We'll see. I think there's some some challenges to overcome there, um, but I think it's inevitable that these kind we're we're all becoming more interconnected with the products we use with each other with our worlds in general, and that's just going to continue. And gamification, as such, I think is just going to sort of ride along that and help us engage better with the world via multiple different kinds of technology. So I have one last question that. I'd really love your thoughts on as we close, which is when you look at today's social media landscape through your system designer lens, and you think about loops and emergence and unintended consequences, mm -hmm. what do you see, particularly with Facebook? You know, I think that there are, as in any complex system, there are multiple loops there, multiple systems that are interacting and, and, and sometimes complementing each other and sometimes really um, uh, competing with each other. Um, there's a social system that uh, when I post something and one of my friend likes it or puts a little heart on it, that's terrific. I mean, that's that's uh, that, that gives me a, a good feeling. I want to interact with that person more. And as such, I want to inter interact with Facebook or with other social media more. Um, so we all like keeping up with our family and friends. And I think there's a lot to um, that makes that a wonderful reinforcing system. Um, I went to an international high school, and so I have you know, old, old friends that are literally around the globe. And we were very few of us were in contact prior to social media, but we many of us are now uh, because of that. So there's a lot of great things that have happened that way. At the same time, there's a couple of things I think most of us don't like. Um, we don't like noise in our system. We don't like spam or trolling posts or, or things like that. Um, so one of two things, there's an interesting really unconscious systemic thing happens that I try and fight against. And I have to say I've only been partially successful. And that is we either on our own uh, weed people out or, or focus more on some people than on others, or like on Facebook or YouTube, we let the algorithms do it for us. And without maybe ever knowing it, we've gotten ourselves into an echo chamber where everyone sounds and, and talks just like us and has the same view of us. And so on the one hand, you could say, well, everything's great because everyone thinks just like I do. But on the other hand, we are missing out on, on a really broad diversity of views. Now, admittedly, some of those views are really toxic and you don't want to have those in your life. And that's perfectly understandable. But finding that balance between not having toxic views in your life or toxic people in your life and not having only people who agree with you is a really tough thing. And unfortunately, I think some of the underlying software systems, well, it's clear, some of the underlying software systems are enabling that process rather than helping us find a balance, They're enabling the, the echo chamber process. There's a great cartoon. I, I wish I had it here. Uh, it's a couple of farm animals saying, isn't it great? We get all the food we want and you know, free room and board. And the caption is, when you're the, if it's free, you're the product, not the customer. And it's true. We are the product. Uh, we are being sold to advertisers on any kind of social media. And I think as long as we understand that and understand what part we're playing in the system and how we can choose mindfully to engage or disengage with the system, we're much better off than if we just say, well, there was an ad or a post, so it must be correct and it must be true and it must be worth my time. Not Those things are not necessarily true at all, but that takes a little bit more responsibility on our part to say, as an active consumer, is that something that I wanna to attend to? Is that something I want in my life? Do I really think that's that's correct? For better or worse, I'm, I think, known amongst my friends as the person who will fact check something and go as quickly as possible to primary sources. I just think that's vitally important. And it it, it punctures a lot of, of balloons of, of uh, things that are dubious or not necessarily true. Um, but I think that that kind of, of view of the system that I'm in, in my social media eco ecology is really important. Oh, that was beautifully said. That gives me a hopeful feeling, which <laughs> is a great note to end on. 
Thank you so much, everyone who came and asked questions. Uh, we will continue to interact in the comments. And thank you, Mike, for joining us and sharing your wisdom and perspective. Again, Mike's book is linked in the comments. All the diagrams we showed today are from Mike's book. So if you love this and you want to dig deeper, you know where to go. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Want more? Join me in the Game Thinking Hub, our free group for product leaders who want to innovate smarter. Go to gamethinking.io slash hub and sign up today. I'll see you there.